very much. Thank you, Rosie. I, I wasn't showbiz editor of The Express. Uh, Rosie appointed me showbiz editor of The Express, which in retrospect was a, was a very daft thing to do. Let, let me begin by apologizing in advance. I, I routinely inflict t three 20 minute monologues on my radio audience every day. So the discipline of doing this in 15 minutes is something I'm, I'm quite excited about. And let me also apologize for essentially talking about myself. I, I was worried that it might be immodest, but my wife pointed out that I've just published a book called How to Be Right. So I, I don't really get to stand in front of you and apologize for essentially talking about myself. Because um, what, what's happened in the last 14 years or so as a, as a radio phone-in host is I've gone from talking almost exclusively about potholes and parking tickets to being featured on the front of last week's New York Times International edition as, as some sort of um, unintentional anecdote to Brexit and a lot of what has been filed under fake news. So to begin at the beginning, people often think that it's easy um, or that the most important thing about a radio phone is making the phones ring. And, and it's easy to see why people think that. The very first time I did the job, um, it was 47 minutes before anybody rang me. I was 47 minutes saying essentially the same things in a slightly different order um, for what felt like an eternity. And then the first phone number that flashed up on the screen, I, I actually recognized. This was... <laughs> This was 10.47 p.m. on a Saturday night, and it was my home phone number that, <laughs> that came up on the screen with, with my wife um, clearly poised to put me out of my misery. It, it worked up to a point because the second name that came up on the screen was my best friend Luke, who is an actor and who decided that he better disguise himself, despite the fact that obviously nobody listening, if indeed anybody else was listening, would have the first idea who he was. So he decided to conduct his call to the program in a Northern Irish accent. Um, <laughs> and then promptly forgot about halfway through the call and his, his accent completely disappeared. But the point is, it is very easy to make the phones ring. All you need to do, for example, is say, is there anybody old out there feeling poorly? <laughs> or has anyone ever had a parking ticket that they feel was really unjust? <laughs> Neither of which, of course, are guaranteed to prompt interesting calls. And that, that's where the rather strange journey that I've been on begins. I, I used to enjoy the, the slightly surreal nature of the medium. I, I remember quite early on, I used to do a quiz on Fridays because I'm, I'm quite lazy and it's easier than talking about the news. And there was a lovely lady who rang in to, to do my quiz of the week and she pulled the question out of the hat, which was, how many kings of England have been called Henry? And she said, well, she said, I know, I know there's Henry VIII, James. So, and I know there's Henry V. <laughs> Is it three? <laughs> and and th these were sort of baby steps towards understanding how valuable it would be and how important it could be to, to dig a little deeper than the initial exchanges allow. Ra radio phone ins historically have been dedicated to asking people what they think. And somewhat sadly, in, in the sort of 20 years, 25 years that, that I've been in the media, I think an awful lot of the rest of the industry has fallen into the trap of asking people what they think, not why they think it. Um, it leads, in, in my view, it leads to Donald Trump, it leads to what Kellyanne Conway described as alternative facts, and, uh, and it leads also to, to, to some of the negatives of Brexit. I, I'm not here to proselytize about why I think it's an absolutely disastrous um, decision that the country has taken. I'm here to understand why people are arguing that the, <laughs> why people are arguing that black is white. Why people are now seeking to persuade themselves of things that two and a half years ago they knew not to be true. And I think it's linked to this notion of false equivalence. I, I think that um, if if we were if we were in sort of uh, 16th century Florence and we were discussing heliocentrism, the, the way things have shaken down on the BBC in particular and in the rest of the media over the last few years is I would introduce you, and when I was presenting Newsnight, I came fairly close to encounters like this. I would introduce you to my right to, to Mr. Galileo Galilei, who is here with his, his star charts and his, his planetary diagrams, and indeed the telescope that he borrowed off Nicholas Copernicus and has used to demonstrate beyond any doubt that the um, Earth revolves around the sun and not the other way around. And, and then having given Mr. Galileo Galilei 10 minutes of time and attention. I'd be duty bound under BBC impartiality as it currently stands to turn to Mr. Nigello Lorsini, who would have 
absolutely no evidence. Um, he wouldn't know one end of the telescope from the other, but he's written a short pamphlet about why he's absolutely certain that the sun actually revolves around the Earth, and he now gets exactly the same amount of time as Galileo Galilei to put forward his utterly bogus agenda. And the point is, of course, that it gets treated with the same reverence and respect. We, we, we heard a phrase in the early days of the Brexit debate thanks to the, the sort of efforts of people like Nigel Farage. This phrase, legitimate concerns, entered the mainstream of public discourse. When they were concerns, certainly, but they weren't remotely legitimate. And, and that is where my job began to become something very, very unexpectedly exciting and, and um, dare I say, possibly even important. It, it, it came as a bigger shock to me than anybody else. My, my introductions to radio came via Beacon, radio in Wolverhampton as a, as a child. I used to ring in on Saturday mornings to tell jokes uh, to a presenter called Gordon Astley, who in a brief aside, I'll tell you, had the best jingle in the history of radio. Gordon, Gordon, drives away your boredom. If you wake up feeling ghastly, tune in to Gordon Astley. <laughs> and th th there was a call quite early on um, in my broadcasting career that, that cut to the heart of this notion of false equivalence and legitimate concerns and the importance of asking people why they think something rather than what they actually think. I don't really care what you think, um, I realized after about five years of asking people. I, I don't care what you think because I don't know why you think it. You, what you think only becomes interesting when you explain to me why you think it, where that thought has come from. And if what you think is demonstrably wrong but you're slavishly allied to the belief that it's true, then what you uh, why you think what you think becomes doubly and triply interesting. So a, a very familiar refrain, and, uh, and, and I, I want to stress that none of the people whose calls are transcribed in my book are, are, are stupid. Um, none of them are, uh, in my view, necessarily even to blame for the curious places in which they've ended up. But it was a chap called John in Hounslow who first focused my mind on this question because um, he rang up to say something that we've all heard or read in the letters pages of, of, of the Daily Express or the comment section of the Daily Mail. He rang up to say that you're not allowed to say what you want in this country anymore about immigration without being called a racist. So I told him that whatever he said, I promise I won't call you a racist. And there was a sort of pause and a, and a sort of gulp and a slight sense of panic on his part because no one's ever expected to follow up on that. It's the what. What do you think? Not why do you, why do you think you're not allowed to say? What is it you want to say, John, that you think you're not allowed to say without being called a racist? And there, there was quite a long pause. I do like pauses. I think, oddly, silence is sometimes the best bit of radio broadcasting. There's quite a long pause, and John said, Hounslow's full of Pakistanis, and they all smell. I, okay, um, bearing in mind we're live and I have no idea what's going to come out of a, of a caller's mouth before it comes out. So I asked him, what, what do they smell of, John? Another slight pause. And he said, curry. Another pause. And I said, do you like curry, John? And he said, yes. Now, I don't know if he went away having had some sort of Damascene conversion or whether he'd come to a, a better understanding of his own borderline bigotry, but, but I felt that for everybody else listening, it was quite a useful illustration of the fact that you can generally say whatever you want in this country about immigration without being called a racist, unless, of course, what you say about immigration is actually racist. Um, this culminated a few years later in an interview I did with Nigel Farage in which I reminded him of some comments he'd made about people speaking foreign on trains, um, something that he felt very passionate about and had clearly sort of erected a maypole around which many people danced, the kind of people who feel that you're not allowed to say what you want about immigration in this country without being called a racist. And I, I very simply said to him, what language does your wife speak to your children at home? And he said, well, German. But I don't imagine they speak it on trains. <laughs> and again, you find yourself realizing that what we've allowed to be described as legitimate concerns 
are, are nothing of the kind. This notion that, uh, that, that, that we inhabitants, I'll take a punt on the postcode that I'm in tonight and, and say that we inhabitants of a metropolitan liberal bubble are somehow blind to the realities of immigration, somehow blind to the negatives of it, is, is probably the biggest lie or the biggest misconception that's been allowed to go unchecked. And of course, it's largely launched by um, people who are a million miles away from the experience of ordinary voters. The German media reports today on Angela Merkel's amnesty for, for one million refugees, and, and just as in this country, but again, criminally underreported, the areas where refugees have been successfully assimilated are the areas that are least negative about Angela Merkel's decision to invite refugees into Germany. The areas where you, you, you can't see a refugee for love nor money, they're the areas where it has become a, a big, uh, polling-wise, it's become a big negative, and it, it's not actually hard to see why. It, the, the, the conclusion of my book, was supposed to make suggestions as to how things could be improved for the future. And I'd submitted my final, I thought, draft when uh, it containing the suggestion that we needed to see Paul Dacre removed from the editorship of the Daily Mail and the ludicrous website Infowars um, removed from YouTube, uh, both of which happened about a week before the book went to the press. So, so, so I had to rewrite the conclusion. And, and I mention that because the people who are fearful of immigration, fearful of refugees, they, they never mean people. After the Brexit vote, the number of calls I took from foreigners, from European Union citizens, saying that their colleagues, their friends, in some cases their family members who'd voted to leave, had said to them, oh no, I don't mean you. I didn't mean you. And you say, well, who did you mean? And they meant the focus of the legitimate concerns. They make the faceless, the unidentified, uh, the hordes, to coin one of David Cameron's many unfortunate phrases. They, they didn't mean real people. They meant rhetorical flourishes. They meant vote-winning slogans and, and fatuous asides thrown out by people like Boris Johnson and Nigel Farage in, in pursuit of fame and fortune. And it, it leads to some very, very strange places. Um, but it also leads to some positive ones. I, there's a little exchange here with a chap called Ray who rang me to say, I was just listening to what you said about the internet melting our brains, and I wanted to tell you what happened to me. I don't really know any Muslims, but I started reading stuff online a few months ago, the EDL and that, and the more I read, the angrier I got. I said, angry about what, Ray? He said, angry about these people poncing off us while plotting to kill us. I said, wow. He said, I know, but they'd back it up, James, by quoting bits of the Quran or the Hadiths and kind of prove all their points about Muslims without ever actually talking to any. I said, so what happened? And Ray said, my wife told me to stop. I said, what do you mean? He said, I was getting angry with her, mate. I was getting angry with the family, with everyone. I'd start trying to convince everyone that we were under siege and they just couldn't see it. The wife said I was making myself ill and making her unhappy and she told me to leave the laptop under the sofa for a month. What happened, Ray? I was sorted in less than a week, James. <laughs> I never look at that stuff anymore, and I couldn't be happier. Um, another example of, of really where journalism has let us all down. This is a chap called Andrew who rang in to tell me that you can't celebrate Christmas in this country anymore. I, I said, really? He said, yes. I said, where? He said, anywhere, in public. Um, and it turned out that he'd believed the story about um, Winterville, He'd never Googled the word Winterville. Winterville's a fascinating thing that a marketing director in Birmingham came up with as a way of justifying not having to pay to take the lights down between three successive festivals. I think it was Diwali, Christmas, and Eid. So he had this genius notion of calling it Winterville, and they could leave all the decorations up for the duration, and uh, the council would save a ton of money. Of course, by the time it had been put through the mill of Kelvin McKenzie's son, this had become an assault upon Christian values. There's another story in there about the idea that Muslims complain about the flag of St. George, and they insist on taking it down. It's happened once in a tiny village in Somerset, and the first people to complain were the local Muslims because they knew how this was going to play out. They knew who was going to get it in the neck. And yet still, in the Telegraph as recently as three years ago, these stories are still inflated and still reported. Why? Because they are legitimate concerns. Except, of course, they're not. They're nothing of the sort. And this is where it leads. Jack in Croydon was frightened of a balloon. Frightened of a, of a big orange balloon depicted Donald Trump that was, of course, flown above Parliament Green during his last visit. And so furious was Jack in Croydon that he rang in to tell me he was going to take his drone down to Westminster and fly it deliberately 
into the balloon. Um, and it was funny for a while until I asked him what was wrong with mocking politicians. Um, I said to him, surely it's a good idea to mock politicians. He said, no, not really. I said, really? You don't think any politician should be mocked, Jack? What about mocking disabled journalists? Where do you stand on that? Because Jack, of course, was a Trump fan. And then something really weird happened. You, you, you will probably be aware that Serge Kovaleski of the New York Times has an impairment that visibly affects the flexibility and the movement of his arms. Donald Trump singled him out for ridicule during a rally in South Carolina. He said, you've got to see this guy, and then started jerking his arms spasmodically. Um, here's Jack in Croydon in 2018. His answer to my question, where do you stand on the abuse of disabled people? Well, where do you stand on fake news, James? I said, well, I'm passionately opposed to it, but you can't answer a question with a question. I can't do it, James. Sorry, I can't answer fake questions with fake answers. Sorry, mate. It's not a fake question. How do you feel about the mocking of disabled journalists? And he replied, fake news. I said, but we've seen the pictures, Jack. Fake news. So the pictures are fake? Fake news. Okay, so how about the mocking of gold star families? Gold star families, again, fake news. You've seen it on your screen, Jack. I've seen it on my screen, mate. Fake news. How, how do you know the story about the balloon isn't fake? Why have you chosen to believe this? You're going nuts about it, and I know why. Jack, I, I think it's funny. I'm not going nuts about it. I'm giggling. You're the one who's phoned me about a giant balloon. I don't think you've phoned me before. I, I just want to know why. Because it's pathetic, James. I really cannot understand why you just keep attacking Donald Trump. <sighs> Give me some real facts, he said, and then we can talk about them. I said, I just did. He mocks disabled journalists. He boasts about sexually assaulting women. He's a multiple bankrupt. Fake news. He mocked the parents of a gold star soldier. Fake news, fake news. And we called an end to the call. And I suspect that until we start recognizing that legitimate concerns are not legitimate concerns, and still we start recognizing from, I'm afraid, the top of the BBC down, I say that with a nod to one of the later speakers this evening, um, that false equivalence is not equivalence, that balance is not putting a liar on the same television program as somebody telling uncomfortable truths. And I suspect that until we start pointing out that there is news and then there is falsehood, there are going to be a lot more jacks, which is great for my career, not so good for my soul. Thank you very much.